spent most of his career as a senior civil servant, starting in the Treasury in 1987. He's been chief economist uh, at the Cabinet Office, and he was also um, chief economist at the Department of Work and Pensions for a period. He's now um, uh, gone to academic life uh, and freer to uh, speak his mind, which he's promised to do. So, Jonathan. I think Dublin is, uh, and Ireland in general, find themselves in a rather better place uh, um, economically and socially. Um, than, I, than, than was the case when I was last here. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, um, it's quite difficult to say the same about the UK, um, which yet wherever you stand on the uh, political spectrum, we have had, uh, um, I think, by far the most turbulent few years in British politics um, in my, um, my living memory and my professional career. Um, and uh, that means uh, that... Uh, uh, I, well, I will say quite a lot and give quite a lot of opinions during the course of this talk. Uh, um, you, uh, you have to take everything I say with a, uh, with, uh, certainly everything that I say on, on some of the, not, not so much on the economics, but on the political economy of what I say with, the, with a certain amount of salt. Uh, because those people, especially those of my colleagues who've, who've made political predictions uh, um, in the last year or two have, uh, have not done very well. So first of all, why did we vote to leave? Um, and I think it's important to, uh, here I am straying very much into the political economy of, uh, of Brexit, but I think it's important just to establish this because it does tell you a bit about where we might be going. Um, so voting leave was correlated uh, with uh, lower income, but more strongly than that, lower educational attainment. Uh, there was an age gap, older people much more likely to vote leave. There wasn't much in the way of a gender gap. Um, place did matter, less prosperous areas were more likely to vote leave, even controlling for the demographics. And ethnicity mattered a bit, um, although uh, um, not as much perhaps as, as some might have expected. Quite a lot of, uh, uh, quite a large proportion of the uh, non-white uh, group in the UK did actually vote to leave. Um, but the role of these characteristics was very strongly mediated by actual social attitudes and values. Um, so this, this shows, uh, um, just to give an example here, that for, of people who say they support the death penalty, three quarters of them voted to leave. Of people who say they oppose the death penalty, only one in five voted to leave. And this is quite interesting, of course, because the death penalty is not an issue in British politics. No one really cares about it that much. Um, but whether or not you say you support the death penalty um, is a sort of broader signifier of your social attitudes and values. Um, and that, that wider set of social attitudes and values is very strongly correlated with how you voted um, in the Brexit referendum. So it does, it represent, the, the vote genuinely represented a sort of cultural, um, geographical, and to some extent economic uh, uh, split. Um, in the UK. Um, and why does that matter? Um, uh, I think it matters to, the, to where we're going, um, both in terms of Brexit and, and as a country as a whole, um, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, the first of all is that, that values do appear to trump economic interests, even, even if the, the values obviously, you know, the, these are nothing here is, is completely. Uh, um, exogenous, the causality between people's values and their economic situation runs both ways. Um, there are a couple of very good articles by Martin Sandbu in the FT over the last couple of days on this, which I would highly recommend to people who are further interested in this, this difficult set of issues. I think what it does mean, though, is that this pro-Brexit political coalition um, isn't going to be swayed very much by the fact that banks are ta saying that they're going to move their head offices to Dublin or Frankfurt. That is not going to change the minds of many people who voted to leave. Uh, uh, um, so uh, um, some, at least, of you know, the economic consequences that you see from the other side of the IRC or, or our partners from the other side of the channel and say, ha, the Brits are now realizing uh, just what a stupid idea this was, that isn't going to resonate with that many people who voted leave. Uh, it's going to take more than that. Um, and it means that we are largely boxed in, at the moment at least, to some of our key red lines on, on free movement and sovereignty, or at least that is how it is perceived. So I think that, um, 
and, and I'll try and nuance this a bit later on, perhaps in questions, that at the moment the prospect for, for reversing where we're going, reversing the, the, light, the trajectory that we're on, looks bleak unless we get a, a severe and widespread economic downturn. And so I don't mean just investment decisions being held up or some um, uh, companies or institutions relocating their head offices. Uh, but a more widespread economic downturn in the 18 next 18 months. And at the moment, that is not happening. It may happen, but it's not happening yet. So all that, I think, stepping back means that the most likely outcome, not, as I say, you know, uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't bet on my predictions or anyone else's, but the most likely outcome still seems to me that, that we have some form of hard or possibly chaotic Brexit. And I'll say what I mean by those later on. Um, so uh, what... Can we say about the economics? Um, first of all, very briefly, uh, um, and this will come as no surprise to a, an Irish audience, I suspect, although it uh, doesn't always go down that well with some British audiences, that, yeah, that EU membership was good for the UK. Um, we know that. That is pretty solidly established in the economic literature, and you get estimates of an 8 to 10% boost to GDP or GDP per capita or productivity uh, for the standard reasons. Um, but I do think it's important uh, for economists to emphasize that these things are not symmetric. And the fact that EU membership was good for the UK um, by a reasonably quant by a, uh, uh, an amount that we can reasonably quantify does not mean that, that leaving the UK, the, the EU will be bad for the UK. It certainly doesn't mean that you can take the quantitative estimates that we have of the impact of joining um, and translate those into negatives from, from leaving. Um, and if you look under the skin of some of the econometric estimates that I'll talk about later, that is sort of what they're doing. And, and therefore, in my view, they do need to be treated uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, and what we can say is that the economic impact so far um, has, been, uh, has been actually quite small. And what economic impact they, we have seen has come pretty much exclusively through the fall in the exchange rate. So we know the fall in the exchange rate has, has boosted inflation. Um, that's reduced real wages and, to some extent, real domestic demand. That's all sort of standard macro stuff. But in a sense, that doesn't tell you that much about Brexit because the, you, the pound goes up and down all the time. It's, not a, it's a large fall in the exchange rate, but it's not an unprecedentedly large fall in the exchange rate. Um, and it might have happened for some other reason anyway. So it doesn't tell you that much, whereas the more Brexit-specific impacts that were talked about in the run-up, in particular, the impact of uncertainty um, on um, business and consumer confidence, and hence on uh, both investment and consumption, those impacts have not yet been visible in the data. So, so far, apart from the exchange rate impacts, it's actually quite difficult to see any uh, uh, impact of Brexit. Um, now, that is projected to change. I won't go through this in any detail, but this is just the IMF projections. Um, I mean, but the, the key point here is that uh, in 2015, we were at sort of the, uh, the top of the, close to the top of the developed country uh, growth league, um, and we are projected to fall um, back quite significantly, much more towards the bottom as the Eurozone does much better and we do significantly worse. But this is still not disaster, right? 1.5% roughly growth uh, in 2018 is, uh, is mediocre. Um, but then the UK economy, again, is no stranger to mediocre economic performance from time to time. Uh, so it would be hard to describe this as, uh, you know, uh, 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 this, if, if this turns out to be the case, as, as the end of the world. Um, of course, uh, um, uh, these things can change quite quickly. Um, and uh, it seems to me that there is at least some possibility that we will, we will see a very abrupt reversal, that the uncertainty-related impacts on, on business and consumer confidence, which some people forecast, the Treasury in particular forecast, as it being a direct result of the referendum, will materialize as a result of uh, uh, some breakdown in negotiations or some uh, 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 particular uh, event on the timetable over the next 18 months. Um, but uh, as yet, it has not happened. So what, where, therefore, could we be headed? Um, there is a lot of talk in the UK about uh, um, hard and soft Brexit, and there is also uh, um, a lot of talk um, because of the Prime Minister's phrase that no deal is better than a bad deal, of what the implications of, of no deal 
would be. Um, and I think this does get uh, um, does quite quite confusing. Um, so we have tried, we and my my colleagues uh, uh, um, in the UK and in Changing Europe have tried to present a sort of taxonomy of uh, of the different types of outcome that might materialize over the next 18 months. Um, and you, know, you can quarrel with some of these, and there are perhaps some intermediate positions, but I think this gives some idea of, of the possibilities. Um, the first possibility is a, is a chaotic Brexit, where we have literally no Article 50 deal. Um, and I think uh, um, we, we recently produced a publication, which is on our website, called The Cost of No Deal, uh, um, and I have to say, I went into it thinking, when, when, when I and my colleagues started looking at the different aspects and trying to write it, thinking, well, it's not, um, uh, um, it's clearly going to be bad, but it's not going to be disastrous. These pe when people talk about planes stopping flying between Dublin and London or whatever, or the electricity being cut off, they, they surely are exaggerating. And I think what we concluded was that while that is, those things are probably you can probably mitigate those impacts. Um, it actually would be pretty disastrous for the UK. Pretty bad for the rest of Europe, frankly, too, uh, uh, but pretty disastrous for the UK. Um, and one, you know, on my own particular area of, of immigration and free movement, um, one thing which really strikes me, which, which is not highlighted very much in the UK, is that the, um, the day after a no, you know, on, on March 30th, 2019, if there is no Article 50 deal, the status of uh, EU citizens in the UK um, will be sort of all right because UK law has incorporated the key provisions of, of the relevant directives. And those, so UK law states EU citizens have the following rights. And that will not change uh, um, as a result of no deal. Now, there will be all sorts of uncertainties and problems. I won't min minimize the, the difficulties that these people will, will, uh, uh, will be in uh, um, after no deal. Um, but there, if you think about it, that's nothing compared to what will happen to uh, UK citizens on the continent. Ireland, of course, is somewhat different because of the historical legacy. But to UK citizens on the continent who are currently, again, Belgian domestic law says EU citizens have the following rights. But on March 30th, 2019, under no deal, um, UK citizens will not be EU citizens anymore. What will their rights be in Belgium? I genuinely don't know, and my lawyer colleagues don't know either. Um, and I think that is really, really frightening, the idea that there are close to a million Brits who on the day after no deal would literally, would they be illegal immigrants? Would they be working illegally? Technically, quite possibly, yes. Uh, um, that is not something I think any British government should be willing to compromise. Second uh, uh, set of options, uh, cliff edge Brexit, uh, where we do get a deal on the Article 50 issues, but there's no deal on the future relationship and there is no transitional period. So that's where we go straight in. That is an orderly Brexit that no nothing stops working, but we immediately go to a full customs border, uh, full tariffs on WTO, most favored nation terms, and all the rest of it. Um, again, pretty, pretty nasty from the point of view of the UK economy and not helpful from the point of view of the rest of Europe either. Uh, the third, which is where the government seems to be headed at the moment, is uh, hard, what I describe as a hard but orderly Brexit. That is to say, we have an Article 50 deal and we have some agreement that at least for a transitional period, uh, not too much changes, but there is only no or only a limited deal on our future relationship. So that, in, in that sense, we still end up with a hard Brexit, but it, we do it in a much more orderly, drawn-out way that allows us to at least manage and mitigate the economic consequences. Um, and then finally, you have a, the softer version, which is not on the agenda for the UK government at the time, but then the UK government that, uh, that we have now may not be here in, uh, in three or six or 12 months, which is a much uh, softer Brexit where we have an EEA or an EEA-like relationship where we try and negotiate um, membership uh, uh, um, in either uh, in, in the single market and the customs union, either permanently or over a very extended transition or implementation period or, or limbo period, as you might call it. Um, but the fundamental problem here, of course, remains is that we don't know, we, the UK, and indeed, you know, don't know collectively which sort of Brexit we want. Uh, we genuinely don't. 
Um, we do not know whether we want a Nigel Farage Brexit, um, a Liam Fox Brexit, or a Keir Starmer Philip Hammond Brexit. Uh, um, to you know, and what I mean by those is is not so much the options we know, but, but you know, what's our vision of the UK's place in the world in ten years? Um, the vision of uh, a, a Farage Brexit is one of us reversing globalization, shutting ourselves off to people, um, but also to some extent uh, um, to, uh, um, to the other aspects of globalization. To the extent that we ha would have a key international relationship, it would be, be, be with the US as a effectively a, 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 a subsidiary of a Trump-oriented a Trump America. Um, so that's the sort of Farage ver vision. Um, the Liam Fox vision is, is much more of a global Britain where we'll be freely trading with the world um, and we'll leave you parochial, insular, protectionist Europeans behind as we sail off and make deals with, um, with the US but also with India, China and, 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 and so on. Um, and then there's the, uh, the Keir Starmer and Philip Hammond version of Brexit which is basically that to the extent possible we keep things as, we are as they are now while leaving the political structures of the European Union, but we recognize that our fundamentally, our most important economic and trading relationship by far is with uh, the EU27, and that our priority must be to, to preserve that, um, at the same time as continuing, as we always have done, uh, to trade with the rest of the world. Um, so this is a sort of, uh, um, not a status quo, because leaving the EU in political terms means quite a lot, obviously, it's not the same. Um, but it is a lot closer to status quo than either two. And frankly, the, the point is that the UK has not made up its mind, and, and you know, uh, we haven't had the debate between these versions of Brexit. Um, almost certainly, there is no majority for any one of those versions of Brexit, which obviously uh, is quite a, a difficult problem in a, you know, if you're trying to think about how we get from where we are now to settling on one of them. Uh, since there's no majority for any of them and we don't have clearly identified political parties identified with one or the other, um, it, it's quite difficult to see how we resolve this particular uh, set of uh, dilemmas. On to the um, economic impacts of these various, uh, 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 various possible scenarios. Um, just to list the, the key aspects, uh, um, and I'll talk mostly about trade and migration because uh, um, uh, uh, those are the ones where most work has been done. Uh, and where I think, which I think matter most. Um, and uh, um, so on trade, the key point obviously is that it, the impacts will depend both on the nature of our future trading relations with the EU and also on what uh, our, our trading relations with third countries are. And this is something where we have a fair amount of evidence to, to go on. Regulation, I think we can uh, uh, fairly safely say at the moment there is no great political will in the UK to make major changes to the regulatory environment. Um, if anything, we're moving somewhat away from the current, uh, our, our current ultra-flexible approach to labor market regulation for reasons which don't have that much to do with Brexit. It's perhaps just a natural swing in the pendulum in the way the, the UK economy has evolved. I think there is a degree of consensus that, that uh, the relatively flexible labor market model that we had in, in the early 2000s, which worked pretty well then, in my view, is not working so well now, and a bit of extra regulation is called for. It won't be a huge change, but if it, but the, the key point here is that we're not going to leave and suddenly deregulate the labor market or remove the aspects of labor market regulation we have. It's not going to happen. Um, and similar, similar things apply on environmental and other aspects of regulation. Um, budget contributions, you know, again, this is macroeconomically not a big deal. We will get some benefit from not paying in eventually, but not in the short term. Um, and immigration, what are the impacts of a likely sharp reduction in EU migration to the UK? Um, so this just gives a summary of, 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 of the, uh, um, the credible estimates that are out there from, uh, um, from people uh, um, using reasonably well-established models. Um, and I think that, that I'm not going to describe these in details. So that, that I'd make two key points. First of all, that the, the estimates range from down to you know a hit of 2% of GDP up to 8% uh, of GDP. Um, and that's quite a big range. And it reflects, I think, the uncertainties I described before about trying to use uh, historical data to project forward. Um, and I think it represents, to my mind, a sort of reasonable set of plausible bounds. I do not see that it's likely that leaving the EU will do 
as much damage as we gain from joining the EU. So I think excess uh, negative impacts of greater than 80% beyond, you know, outside a total chaos scenario don't seem to me plausible. Um, whereas on the other side, 2% is, is quite small. And if you think about it, these are quite, you know, this is quite a range. This is over 15 years or so. So a 2% head to GDP is maybe a tenth of a percent point off each year for 15 years. Well, that's not a good thing. Um, obviously, tenths of a percentage point on compound growth rates matter, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, but it's hardly noticeable, uh, certainly not from a year-to-year -year basis. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, 8% is, is uh, um, 0 0.3, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, is about half a percent off the growth rate each year. That is quite a big deal. Um, and certainly compounded, it is a very big deal. But again, it doesn't mean we're a, we become a poor country. Uh, we're still growing on our most reasonable perspectives. We're just, we just notice our relative standard of living compared to you guys and the rest of Europe falling slightly farther and farther behind each year. Um, so you end up with a, the, a, a view that, you know, leaving the EU will not be economically painless but it won't be economically cataclysmic either. It will be something in between the, uh, you know, sort of unpleasant but not, but not too bad through to really rather nasty but not the, en not the end of the world. And I think that, to me, is a sort of reasonable way of characterizing what the bounds of possibilities are at the moment. Um, this would, however, we are talking about quite large impacts on trade. So we're talking about reductions in total trade from most estimates of 20 to 30 percent. So that is quite a big deal. So although we don't use that much in growth, we do see our, the share of trade in GDP would become a much less open country in trading terms. Um, and crucially, I think this is very unlikely to be compensated by increases in, in third country trade. Plausible trade deals with, uh, um, again, the, these are methodologically quite difficult and, and you can quarrel with them, but no one, I think, suggests that, that the impact on total trade of any plausible free trade deals with other countries is going to be anywhere near enough to offset the negative impacts of, of leaving the single market. Finally, uh, say a few words about my own recent re research on immigration. Um, so uh, uh, this is a recent paper. I published in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy on the determinants of EU migration to the UK. Um, and I think two key points here. One is that free movement in and of itself really does matter. Uh, um, you really do see it in the data. Whichever way you cut the data, free movement really, really did lead to a large upsurge in migration from EU countries to the UK. Um, and there is every reason to believe that limitation, that, that major restrictions and or the reversal of free movement will lead to very large falls uh, um, in immigration. And this, this assumes still that we retain a, uh, um, a more liberal system in some sense than towards the EU than we do towards the rest of the world, but that free movement itself ends. Um, and you see quite large falls in net, uh, net inflows over the next five years or so. And incidentally, I should note that these estimates were made towards the end of 2016 based on data available then. So far then, we have already seen quite a significant fall in inflows, broadly consistent with the sort of picture we're trying to paint here. So I would argue that the data already supports this idea. And this, of course, is even before free movement ends any changes that are made to free movement in law and policy terms this is purely a result of some of the psychological and uh, 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 practical impacts of free movement in terms of what people think their future rights might be in, in the UK, as well as the broader economic developments in, in the rest of the, uh, the, the Eurozone. Um, and uh, uh, we also try, and this is much more speculative, to project that through into what that might do to, uh, uh, to, to GDP and GDP per capita, um, and again, uh, um, as I say, these, these are highly uncertain sorts of numbers, but you get uh, um, implications for GDP, which again are, are sort of on the, the unpleasant but not the end of the world uh, end of the spectrum. We will be, as a result of uh, uh, leaving the EU and reducing migration, we will be making ourselves somewhat poorer, not disastrously poorer, but somewhat poorer. Exactly how much uh, very much remains to be seen. So 
I'll just conclude on that to say that, you know, uh, um, I don't think we should assume that Brexit necessarily will be a disaster for the UK, either in the short or the long term. Um, but some of the more positive outcomes that you could paint in principle of what Brexit might look like um, do seem to me to be quite implausible, uh, at least given the current political conjuncture um, in the UK. That may change. Uh, meanwhile, the, the short-term impacts are almost impossible to forecast and will depend completely on what happens politically over the next year or so and what the, uh, the market and economic reaction is to those political events. But there are obviously a number of potential uh, um, tipping points. Um, but over the long term, I think we can be reasonably clear that the UK is likely to be less open to trade and migration over the medium to long term as a result of Brexit, and that will uh, make us somewhat worse off, and that is, that is a consequence of the decision we have taken. Uh, we still have the power to, uh, to influence very much exactly how large those effects are, and, 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 and we will see, we will get a, a much better idea over the 18 months over which of these possible trajectories that I've outlined we're going down.